Good morning, everybody. Thank you for coming here again uh, to the colloquium series of the Institute of Astrophysica and Andalusia. And today we will have the talk by Dr. Amaya Moro Martin. And she will talk about interstellar planetesimals, Wamuamua, and Borisov. And uh, Amaya will be properly introduced by Dr. Isabel Marquez. Please, Isabel. Hello, good morning, everybody, and thank you very much for being here again for another web blocking from the Severo Choa program at the, at the IAA. Um, I, first of all, I'd like to thank you, Amara, Amaya Moro, for accepting our invitation. It's a pleasure for us to have you here, Amaya, and we hope that in the, in the, as, uh, as soon as possible, so in the next future, in the coming future, it, it'll be able to, to have you here in person at the, um, at the IAA in Granada and at the IAA. Amaya Moro Martin is an associate astronomer at the Space Telescope Science Institute in, in Baltimore in the United States. She received her PhD from the University of Arizona in 2004. And after that, she worked at uh, Princeton University as a Michelson Fellow and as a Lyman uh, Spitzer Fellow. Um, and uh, then at the Center of Astrobiology in Spain as a Ramon y Cajal uh, Fellow. And since 2014, she works at the Space Telescope Institute, uh, Science Institute, mostly in the James Webb uh, Space Telescope. Her scientific interests include solar and extrasolar uh, circumstellar disks using observations and simulations. She is interested in the properties of the disks, planetesimal and dust populations, the exchange of solid material between planetary systems and the newly found interstellar interlopers. Uh, the overarching goal is to shed light on the formation, evolution, and diversity of planetary systems, helping us place our solar system into context. Uh, today, she's going to talk about interstellar planetesimals, as Rene uh, said. So uh, thank you very much, Amaya, and, and the board is yours. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here virtually, although I'd rather be in Granada with you, but one day, as you said, uh, it will be possible. And I'm going to talk to you about interstellar planetesimals. And let's start here. So this is PanSTARS. It's a 1.8 meter telescope and is constantly surveying the sky for objects that are either moving or that are variable. And it was this telescope that gave, that gave us a huge surprise a few years ago. It was October 18, 2017, when University of Hawaii astronomer Robert Warrick identified an object that had a very unusual trajectory. A few days later, it was confirmed that this trajectory was clearly hyperbolic, like none of the solar system objects discovered so far. This object was the first interstellar interloper ever detected. The astronomical community was immediately notified and many observatories rushed to observe it. Based on its brightness and distance, it was estimated to be about 100 meters across. David Jewett, with whom I wrote a Scientific American article, this figure is from that uh, article, um, colloquially referred to this object as a bat from hell because it is sneaked into the solar system without being seen, approach it from above the ecliptic and re-emerge uh, very close to the Earth. Here is where it uh, re-emerged. And uh, it was, and he refers to it as a bat from hell because when we realize of its presence, around Halloween, it was already on top of us. It was like suddenly feeling the flapping of a bat in a dark cave. And shortly after, it was gone. This object was truly the first visitor from beyond. We know this uh, because it was traveling way too fast to be a solar system object. This is why it was named Oumuamua, that in Hawaiian means something like distant messenger who arrives first. On October 14, 2017, that happens to be my birthday, Oumuamua was at its closest approach to Earth. It came remarkably close, about 60 times the distance to the moon. It didn't come to wish me happy birthday, but to tell me you were wrong. <laughs> and indeed, we were wrong because eight years earlier, together with Ed Turner and Abby Loeb, I led a study where we concluded that the chances of discovering one of these interstellar visitors with current observatories were very bleak. 
We concluded that to detect one, we will have to wait until the Vera Rubin Observatory starts operating in 2022. So Oumuamua was not an unexpected visitor. It was very much expected, but it arrived too early. In that 2009 study, we thought we had understood why nobody had ever detected an interstellar visitor before. We thought this was the case because the number of these objects in interstellar space was low enough that it didn't seem likely that we would run into one object that was large enough and close enough to be detected by current observatories. So the researchers later agreed. With more powerful observatories like Vera Rubin here, the chances increase because you are able to detect the smaller objects at greater distances. So your discovery volume is significantly larger encompassing many more interstellar objects. This is why everyone was very surprised by the discovery of Oumuamua with pan stars. And we lack out. The only reason we were able to detect such a small object only 100 meters across is because it happened to pass very close to the Earth. As I said, 60 times the distance to the moon, which is remarkably close. So a small chunk of rock seeping by, what's exciting, right? I mean, what, what the, what's the fast? We got very excited about its detection because we think interstellar objects like this one are planetesimals that are ejected from other planetary systems. Planetesimals are the building blocks of planets. They are objects larger than a pebble, but smaller than a planet embryo, and they form in protoplanetary disks. This is a snapshot from a numerical simulation that studies the growth of solids in protoplanetary disks. And here you can see the disk from above the plane. The growth is very efficient from dust particles with an initial size of the order of 0.1 microns to particles of a size of a pebble. This is because the dust particles generally move with the gas flow, and therefore the relative velocities and collisional energies are small. This, combined with microscopic forces like the van der Waals and electromagnetic forces, result in very efficient growth. These particles eventually grow into kilometer-sized planetesimals, shown in the bottom figure here, that through collisions and gravitational interactions can grow into larger bodies like asteroids, comets, and planets. Let me show you a computer simulation of the rings of Saturn based on Cassini data. This simulation is a courtesy of the American Museum of Natural History. This simulation show moonlets, baby moons of the size of houses growing into larger bodies. These moonlets are planetesimals, and this is a good scaled down analogy of how planetesimals grow in a protoplanetary disk. Planetesimals are the building block of planets. They are the planet Legos. And understanding them is critical to understand planet formation. Planetesimals also play a key role in habitability. First, because collisions between planetesimals and terrestrial planets are a hazard, but they can also be a source of life because these planetesimals can provide water and other volatiles to the terrestrial planets. And as such, they can play a fundamental role in setting the conditions for life to emerge. Planetesimals also play a key role in the dynamical evolution of the planetary system because the disk of planetesimals interact with the planets and can make them migrate. As they migrate, the planet's gravitational perturbations are capable of sweeping away many of the planetesimals that didn't have a chance to grow, throwing them into interstellar space. Such an ejection may have happened early in the solar system history when it was about 800 million years old, an epoch that we call the heavy bombardment. As you can see here, the orbits of Jupiter and Saturn, red and yellow circles here, migrated due to the interactions with the planetesimal belts. And this led to a re-adjustment re of the orbits and to the ejection via gravitational stabilities of most of the planetesimals in the disk. It's going to happen right now. There you go. But not everything was detected. Here you can see what was left behind. This visual again is a courtesy of the American Museum of Natural History. What was left behind was the asteroid belt consisting on millions of rocky planetesimals left over from the period of planet formation and that survived that episode of planetesimal clearing. And outside Neptune, we have the Kuiper belt consisting on millions of icy planetesimals. Some of these objects are knocked out from their orbits and become comets. The largest of these appear as frozen worlds, including Pluto, that is going to be highlighted right there. 
Farther out, we have the Oort cloud, located between 3,000 and 100,000 astronomical units. These objects are so far away that they are barely bound to the sun. We cannot detect them directly, they are too far, but we know they exist because sometimes they get knocked out from their orbits and they become long period comets, like the super comet that was recently discovered. Because we get about two to three long period comets a year, we can make an estimate of how many kilometer size objects are in the Oort cloud, and this number is about a trillion. We cannot directly observe planetesimals in other planetary systems like we do in the solar system, because those extrasolar asteroids and extrasolar Kuiper belt objects are just too dim. However, we know that they exist because those objects collide, producing dust that forms a disk, and those debris disks can be detected and characterized, and this can help us learn about the underlying planetesimal population. One of the key aspects that we have found from the study of debris disks that trace planetesimals is that planetesimal formation is a robust process that can take place under a wide range of conditions. We have learned this from extensive debris disk surveys that we have carried, among others, with a Spitzer and uh, the Herschel Space Telescopes. These surveys were done in the infrared at different wavelengths. At 24 microns, the surveys are sensitive to dust that is approximately at 150 Kelvin, that for a solar type star would be at a temperature of dust particles, would, would be the temperature of dust particles located between three and five astronomical units, a distance similar to that of the asteroid belt. We refer to this as warm dust. At 70 microns and 100 microns, the surveys are sensitive to dust at around 50 Kelvin that corresponds to a distance of 30 AU, similar to the Kuiper belt. We refer to this as cold dust. The histograms that I'm showing you here show how frequently we find the British emission around different type of stars. The mass and luminosity ranges are here. Um, you, it's, it's very small, but you see that they correspond to a star from A to M type. At 24 microns, we are only able to detect warm dust in systems that contain more than 100 times the amount of warm dust in the solar system. So we are only able to see the tip of the iceberg in this case. While at 70 and 100 microns, the detection limit is between 10 and 20 times the amount of dust in the solar system. So we are able to detect lower, lower quantities of dust, but still is significantly, uh, we, we are only able to detect systems that are significantly more dusty than the solar system. So as I said, this means that these surveys only might be able to detect the tip of the iceberg. We also find that planetesimal disks exist around stars with luminosities that differ by several orders of magnitude. And we also find debris around stars with a wide range of metallicities. And from all this, we can infer that planetesimal formation is a robust process that can take place under a wide range of conditions. We also find that the dust producing planetesimals that are located closer to the star disappear quickly around stars younger than 100 million years using warm emission. But this emission is gone around all the stars here in the bottom part of the diagram. One of the reasons why it is more common to find cold dust uh, than warm dust around mature stars is because the dynamical times in the inner region of the disk are shorter than in the outside. And this makes planetesimals in the inner region collide more frequently and erode more rapidly, causing the production of warm dust to decay as one over T. You can see the decay in these two plots to the left here, showing the dependency of the 24 micron emission with a stellar, uh, on a stellar age of, for solar type stars up here and for uh, A type stars up here. So this is the dependency of the 24 micron emission as a function of time. Um, and uh, the size distribution of the asteroids and the Kuiper belt objects are a fingerprint that this collisional activity play an important role in the early solar system history. Another interesting thing that we observe uh, that can be seen in the bottom left plot is that over that one over T envelope here, there is a lot of scattering. And we think that this dispersion, this scattering indicates that dust production in large stochastic collisions can play an important role in the early evolution of the planetary system. 
The cold dust, on the other hand, shows no significant evolution on giga year time scales. But there is another mechanism yet beyond collisional grinding that is responsible for planetesimal depletion. These are numerical simulations that we made of a system with three giant planets and two planetesimal belts, an inner belt here and an outer belt here. In these simulations, we follow how planetesimals grow and how much dust is being produced. This is what we see here, how much dust is being produced. The solid line here in this insert uh, shows the emission from the dust as a function of wavelength. And the dashed line here is the emission from the star. And this is what will be detected around 24 microns. And this is what will be detected around 70 to 100 microns. The y-axis here shows the eccentricities and the x-axis here shows the semi-major axis. Simulations like this one tell us that the episodes of dynamical instability and planetesimal ejections, similar to what happened in the early history of the solar system, are common under many planetary configurations. And you are going to see it right here. So here's the episode of planetesimal clearing. And, one, and, and we think that Muamua could be one of these planetesimals ejected from another planetary system. One aspect that we explored was the possibility of transferring these ejected planetesimals from one planetary system to another. The transferring probability for the solar system today is extremely low because the sun is moving with respect to the stars in its neighborhood at a velocity high enough that any entering planetesimal will just fly through in a hyperbolic orbit like Oumuamua did. But the stars are generally born in very different environments than where the sun is located today. So stars are generally born in clusters. And we found that in those cluster environments, the probability of transferring solids between one planetary system to another is nine orders of magnitude higher than previously thought. This is because the transfer can take place via chaotic quasi-parabolic orbits instead of hyperbolic orbits where the material generally just flies by, like Oumuamua. These chaotic orbits are possible in this case because the stars in the birth cluster are moving at very small relative velocity with respect to each other, and this favors the capture. The relative velocities are around a kilometer per second instead of the 10 kilometers per second uh, um, that is the relative velocity of the sun with respect to the stars in the neighborhood. This movie here shows how the transfer of uh, of uh, solid material can take place between two stars in a cluster. Planetesimals are going to be ejected from the system zone in green here, and they're going to be transferred to the system zone in red. So um, you see that they move in chaotic orbits until one of them, the one shown in red, is captured by the star shown in blue. And, and the lines here, the green line and the blue line, represent the trajectory of the stars in the cluster. So inside the cluster, we found that the probability of transferring planetesimals between two solar type stars is around 0.1%. This could mean that of the order of 10 to the 14 to 10 to the 16 objects larger than 10 kilograms could have been transferred between our solar system and one of its neighbors before the birth cluster disperse. And this result can have very important implications in the context of lithopanspermia. This is a chronological event chart that shows the timeline of events for the Earth here at the bottom, the solar system here in the middle, and the star cluster here at the top. Take a look at the period of time highlighted in color at the center. At the time, so at Earth, there was evidence of liquid water near its surface uh, fairly early on when the Earth was between uh, around 200 million years old. This is shown as the semi-transparent uh, blue stripe here. So around this time, um, liquid water was probably present near the Earth's surface. This is based on, on the zircons. Uh, the study has been done with zircons. It is also possible that during this time, um, it's not only possible, there is evidence that there was a lot of dynamical activity in the solar system involving planetesimal clearing and heavy bombardment. And it is also possible that at the time, the cluster where the sun was born was still bound. Its dispersal time is uncertain because we don't know how, how big this cluster was. 
Um, but it could have lied within this period. And this is uh, the, the time it, it, um, it disperses is highlighted here in yellow. So the fact that all those factors could have overlapped, that there was liquid water in the Earth's surface, that there was a lot of dynamical activity moving material around, and that the cluster was still bound, uh, means that there was this window of opportunity from the dynamical point of view uh, for the transfer of material of interstellar planetesimals between the solar system and other planetary systems in the cluster. And this is very interesting in the context of lithopanspermia, if life had an earlier star in the solar system or in other planetary systems in its neighborhood. So we have seen how planet formation begins in a sort of orderly fashion but ends in a chaotic mess, and how this can fill the interstellar space with planetesimals. Another source of interstellar planetesimals are the Oort clouds, those clouds of trillions of objects that are weakly bound to the stars. When a star reaches the end of its lifetime, it loses mass, and as a result, the objects in these uh, exo Oort clouds, because they are weakly bound to the star, are released into the interstellar medium. They can also be released due to close encounters with other stars or to the galactic tide. The interstellar planetesimals ejected either from young planetary systems or, or from exo or clouds drift into the interstellar space for millions and millions of years. And in the deep freeze of the interstellar medium, they would remain mostly unaltered, like time capsules of their planetary system most distant past. With all those planetesimals in interstellar space, it was expected that sooner or later, the trajectory of one of them would cross paths with the solar system, becoming an interstellar interloper. But as I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, we didn't think we would detect one until the deep surface of the Vera Ruin Observatory. The fact that we detected one with panstars, a much shallower survey, indicates that the number density of interstellar planetesimals is about 100 times higher than expected. And why this is the case is one of the unsolved mysteries that Oumuamua left. I have tackled this problem in different ways using population studies, and I still cannot account for the number of planetesimals that are supposed to be out there. We have the observations on the one hand and the expectations on the other. Regarding the observations, we know that Oumuamua pass within 0.4 astronomical units of the Earth. We also know that the Pan-Star survey had only been in operation for a few years. If we assume that Oumuamua is representative of a population that is uniformly distributed, from its detection, we can estimate that there are about 10,000 interstellar objects like Oumuamua within the orbit of Neptune at any given time. This is a sphere about 30 astronomical units in radius. So that is what the observations apparently tell us. Assuming Oumuamua is representative of a population that is uniformly distributed. That assumption is critical in this estimate. Regarding the expectations, we can calculate the number of interstellar planetesimals per unit volume of space based on the observed number of stars per unit volume and making an estimate about how many planetesimals each star can eject through the processes that I described earlier, the ejection of planetesimals from John protoplanetary disk and the release of planetesimals from exo clouds triggered by close encounters by, uh, with other stars by the galactic tide or by post-main sequence mass loss. And this is briefly how the calculations are done. The, the, so regarding the ejection of planetesimals from protoplanetary disks uh, shown in this slide here, for the case of single stars, which is shown up here, and also closed binaries, the contribution uh, to, the number, to the mass density of interstellar planetesimals in space is going to depend on the stellar mass. So we have an integral, really, that goes over all stellar masses that contribute. And for each stellar V, the contribution is going to depend on the number density of single stars uh, of that mass. So here is the total number of uh, number density of stars uh, of that mass. And then this is uh, how many of them are single. And it's also going to depend on the total mass available to form solids, uh, which uh, here I assume that it's 10 to the minus 4, the stellar mass. And this 10 to the minus 4 comes from the fact that we are assuming that the disks contain 1% of the stellar mass and that 1% of that material is in the form of solids. Then you assume that most of the material is ejected, and then you can assume, um, and you multiply that by the fraction of stars that contribute, you can assume that these are only the fraction of stars that harbor planets, or you can assume that they all contribute. 
And the way that you calculate the contribution from the white binaries down here is very similar, but in this case, the total mass available to form solids is given by 10 to the minus four, the mass of the, the system. And this 10 to the minus four is not really the, like the one here. This comes from assuming that the circumbinary disk is 10% of the, of the mass of the system and that 10% of the material in that circumbinary disk um, uh, crosses the unstable region at which point these objects are ejected. And then that 1% of the, that material is in the form of solid. So it turns out that this also 10 to the minus four that is coming from, from different dynamics. And uh, so this is how we calculate what, what is the contribution from protoplanetary disks. And then you can estimate what is the contribution from XOR clouds. And the way that you do it is that you assume that each star, um, um, again, you have how many stars, uh, what is the number density of stars that have reached the, the post-main sequence, right? And then you assume uh, that each star is surrounded by the same number of objects that are in the Oort cloud, this 10 to the 12, but a scale to the stellar mass. And you also assume that they are located at the same distances as the Oort cloud, but a scale to the Hill radius of the star. And then depending on where they are located, you assume different ejection efficiencies due to stellar encounters, galactic tide, and post-main sequence mass loss, all these based on dynamical models in the literature. And as you can imagine, there are many uncertainties in this calculation based on population analysis, but the general upper limit would imply that within the orbit of Neptune, there will be 100 objects at any given time. And this is 100 times smaller than the 10,000 objects that we estimated based on Oumuamua's detection. So we are 100 times a, a, a factor of two, I mean, not a, a factor of a hundred of two orders of magnitude of. This discrepancy points out that we still have a lot to learn about the population of interstellar planetes in Mars and their origin. But it could be the case that Oumuamua is not representative of an isotropic distribution of interstellar planetesimals. And this could be the case, for example, if it is coming from a nearby planetary system, in which case we wouldn't infer to have 10,000 objects within the orbit of Neptune. That number will be significantly lower because the objects wouldn't have had time to, to be on an isotropic distribution. And this could make both the estimate and the observations agree. And um, in fact, a recent ejection from a nearby star would be consistent with Oumuamua's velocity. Oumuamua was moving very close to the velocity of the stars in the local neighborhood. And this means that it has not been traveling for too long because otherwise its velocity dispersion would be higher as the velocities tend to increase with time due to objects encountering stars and molecular clouds. A recent ejection is also consistent with the fact that Oumuamua's surface didn't seem to be heavily processed based on its color. KBOs are ultra red because of thousands of millions of years of exposure in cosmic rays, plasma, and radiation, but Oumuamua's surface was not ultra red. Um, but of course, anything derived from the surface can be very, from the colors can be very uncertain. You may ask if we can trace back the trajectory of Oumuamua until we identify the star where it came from, and then we will be able to know if it is in fact coming from a nearby star. Let me show you why this is not simple. This, is, this visual here is also a courtesy from the American Museum of Natural History. This is Gaia data, and every second here corresponds to 30 million years. For reference, the red sphere that you see here indicates the position of the Oort cloud with the sun at its center. As you can see, even in just a second corresponding to 30 million years, the stars move significantly. And this is why it's quite difficult to trace back the orbit of Oumuamua to its parent system, because the stars move and there are uncertainties in their positions, their distances, and their velocities. And I learned recently that an ongoing study uh, using Gaia data has traced back the trajectory of Oumuamua and of about 7 million stars. And this study has been able to identify four stars with trajectories that may have intercepted the trajectory of Oumuamua, so they're following up on those, on those candidates. Another unresolved mystery of Oumuamua is its morphology. This object of about 100 meters in size 
uh, had a brightness that fluctuated very sharply every eight hours. Some brightness variation is suspected because small rocky objects are like lumpy potatoes rotating in a space. And as they rotate, their cross section varies. So they seem to be brighter when they move, um, when more of its area is facing us. But generally the brightness variations is just a few percent. For Umuamua, the brightness variation was much more pronounced, about a factor of 10. Some variation is expected if uh, the surface of the object is more reflected in some areas compared to others, but this non-uniform albedo wouldn't lead, wouldn't lead to brightness variation as drastic as the ones observed. This meant that Umuamua's shape was unusual. It could be elongated like this with an estimated axis ratio of 6 to 1, or it could be disc shape like this. Things got even more interesting when upon close inspection of Oumuamua's orbit, it was discovered that the object was being accelerated like a rocket. As you can see here, this non-gravitational acceleration makes a noticeable difference in the trajectory. So red here is what you would expect if there were no excess acceleration and blue uh, that you can hardly see here, is what was actually observed. A non-gravitational acceleration caused by the J-like force like here is typical in comets and is caused by the mass loss that happens in the day side of the nucleus that creates this reaction force. And uh, here is where the ice is sublimating. So it was proposed uh, that this was what, uh, what was accelerating the, the object. Um, this is another simulation from the American Museum of Natural History. Not a simulation, but yeah, this is like a, a, yeah, a, a simulation. So what is shown here is comet 67P observed by Rosetta. These are real observations actually. So this excess acceleration observed in Oumuamua was interpreted as a result of the expulsion of gases. The big caveat with the interpretation of what is causing Oumuamua's excess acceleration is that Oumuamua never show any evidence of gas and dust loss of surfing comets like this one. The level of water outgassing that would be required to explain the excess acceleration of surfing Oumuamua is 100 times larger than the upper limit inferred from Spitzer observations. The absence of dust in particular is problematic because the gas always drags small dust particles along, but no dust loss was found either, and dust is easier to observe than gas. And it has been argued that maybe only large dust grains were dragged along, in which case the dust outflow could have been unnoticed, but no objects in the solar system are known to have only dust loss of exclusively large particles. Samuel Bilay and Avi Loef put forward the suggestion that this excess acceleration could be due to radiation pressure acting on a membrane like a structure of very thin material, less than a millimeter thick, like the material uh, of, of the birthday balloons. And um, because no natural physical process is known to be able to produce a membrane like that, the suggestion was that this membrane could be a light cell from an extraterrestrial civilization. I follow up on the suggestion that radiation pressure was the cause of the excess acceleration, but instead of acting on a thin membrane um, like this one, what I propose is that it was acting on a naturally produced fractal structure. The idea of proposing a thin membrane is that it can provide a lot of surface area with very little mass, so it can be pushed by radiation pressure easily. But the fractal structure can also do that. This is an interplanetary dust particle collected in a space. It's about 10 microns in size. Its core has a fractal structure. And what I proposed was that Oumuamua could be something like this, but on a much larger scale, like a cosmic dust bunny. A fractal structure like that could also explain the unusual shape of Oumuamua. And I propose a fractal structure instead of a membrane because fractals are found in many forms of nature and are thought to arise naturally because their formation involves processes um, that are stochastic, um, like precisely the particle collisions that form planetesimals in a protoplanetary disk. A fractal aggregate with a density of 10 to the minus 5 grams 
per cubic centimeter. This is about 100 times less than air. Could provide the surface to mass ratio required to account for the observed acceleration of Oumuamua. Let me repeat that the density of Oumuamua would need to be 100 times less than air to be pushed by radiation pressure to the degree that was observed. A material like that is extraordinarily unusual and has never been observed in nature. In fact, the lowest density solid known is graphene aerogel, and it is about 10 times less than air, and it is uh, synthetically produced. And you're probably thinking how in the world such a fragile looking structure could survive the hazards of interstellar space, and indeed this aggregate would be subject to rotational and tidal forces during its journey, but Flecoy and Jane Lu have studied this and they have concluded that not only such an object could survive, but that the interaction of such an ultra low density aggregate with the solar radiation could explain the changes observed in the rotational period of Oumuamua. What is not clear if, it, if, if such an ultra porous structure could survive the ejection from its planetary system and the passage near the sun. But the key question really is how such an ultra low density aggregate could form in the first place. Some of the numerical simulations that study how planetesimals grow via dust collisions in a protoplanetary disk show that beyond the ice line, if the tiny dust particles are covered in ice and are about 0.1 microns in size, the aggregates that form will indeed be very porous. In fact, as the graph shows, they will have less and less density as they grow. The reason why this happens is because early on, when the particles are small and they are strongly coupled to the gas, the relative velocities of the colliding aggregates will be low and as a result, their collisional energies are not high enough to restructure the aggregates. This is why the porosity rapidly increases as they grow and the density goes down. As the aggregates become larger, there starts to be collisional compression, but this compression is inefficient and the porosity of the aggregate continues to increase as it grows because most of the colliding energy is spent compressing the new voids that are created when two aggregates collide and stick into each other rather than compressing the voids that were already present in the colliding aggregates. And this is why the, the, the density keeps decreasing. What this study show is that around 100 meters uh, about the size of Oumuamua, the planetesimals can get to ultra low densities that are comparable to what would be required for Oumuamua to be pushed by radiation pressure. So what I suggested was that Oumuamua could be one of those intermediate early products of the planet formation process seen at the bottom panel here that arise naturally from the collisional growth of icy dust grains. If this were the case, it would be extraordinarily exciting because very little is known about these intermediate early products of planet formation. We can only observe the two extremes of the size distribution, the dust on the smallest end and the planets on the largest end. But we know very little about the intermediate products and those are critical to test planet formation theories. In this context, the possibility that Oumuamua could be evidence of the formation of ultra low density aggregates in protoplanetary disk is very interesting because these porous aggregates can help planetesimals grow and they do need help growing. Because it is well understood how the dust particles grow from tiny dust grains, 0.1 microns in size to the size of a pebble. And it is also well understood how the planetesimals grow from kilometer size to objects of the size of the planet. But that intermediate stage in which centimeter sized planetesimals grow into kilometer size uh, objects is not well understood because those processes seem to be very inefficient. This is known as the meter size barrier and it's a headache for planet formation. And several mechanisms have been proposed to help overcome this barrier. And one of them is the presence of very high porosity planetesimals as the porosity would favor the growth process. There are other origins that have been proposed for an ultra low density Oumuamua. Jane Lu and her group proposed that Oumuamua grew from the collection of dust particles in the coma of an active comet that then they escaped. Another suggestion is that an ultra porous desiccated fragment that resulted um, uh, from the disintegration of an ordinary extrasolar comet uh, as, it as it passed near the perihelium. So Oumuamua will be a fragment of a larger comet. 
uh, of extrasolar origin. That's the, the other potential um, uh, explanation of uh, uh, Anumuamua with an ultra uh, porous nature. There are other potential origins for Umuamua that don't involve uh, an ultra porous aggregate. Um, Sang and Lin have suggested that Umuamua is an elongated fragment that resulted from the tidal disruption of a planet or a small body that came too close to the parent star and that was later ejected to interstellar space. And there is another proposal by Seligman and, and Greg Lofin uh, that um, Oumuamua is a new type of body made of molecular hydrogen ice, a sort of a cosmic hydrogen iceberg that originated in the coldest regions of a molecular cloud. But there are many questions about how it could survive. Unfortunately, we cannot really confirm any of this because Oumuamua's visit was brief and the observations were very limited. So there's a wide range of scenarios, and as you can see, some of them are quite wild, that have been invoked to understand its nature. The situation is very different for Borisov. Uh, Borisov is the second interstellar interloper that was discovered two years after Oumuamua. And Borisov is without question an ice-rich planetesimal ejected from the outer region of an extrasolar planetary system that has been in deep freeze since its ejection. This is a time series Hubble observation of Borisov taken by David Jewett and Max Motzler and his crew and their group. And Borisov here looks like a normal solar system comet. It is estimated that its nucleus is between two to five times larger than Oumuamua, about 200 to 500 meters, but it didn't show any evidence of being elongated. Its trajectory did show an excess acceleration, but in this case, it can be accounted for by gas and gas loss. And it was found to be very rich in carbon monoxide, richer than almost all solar system comets. Because CO ice is so easy to vaporize, this probably means that this extrasolar comet originated from the outermost region of its host planetary system, where it's very cold and the CO can stay in ice form. And this is Borisov trajectory, clearly of interstellar origin. It didn't pass as close to the Earth as Oumuamua, but it was easier to detect because of its large size and cometary activity. And in fact, it can still be observed. One interesting idea that has been proposed and that I'm currently exploring um, with uh, Colin Norman at York Hopkins University is that in the same way that Oumuamua and Borisov cross paths with our solar system, Interstellar planetesimals will also enter stars and planet formation, star and planet formation regions. And um, in these denser environments, instead of flying through like they did in the solar system, these objects might get trapped. In the entire galaxy, it is estimated that they are of the order of 10 to the 24 to 10 to the 25 planetesimals larger than 100 meters. If we assume that the size distribution follows a power law, this means that there is a much larger number of planetesimals larger than a meter. And if planetesimals larger than a meter get trapped in significant numbers, they could act as seeds for planet formation, helping overcome that meter size barrier that I mentioned earlier, and that impedes the formation of kilometer size objects out of centimeter size pebbles. So uh, Colin Norman and I are currently looking at this possibility. We are studying the capture of interstellar planetesimals in three different environments, two representative of the earliest stages of the star formation process, a molecular cloud, and a much more compact stellar kernel, similar to the ones resolved by ALMA, and a protoplanetary disk, representative of a more advanced stage of the planetary formation process. So these are the characteristical physical properties of those environments. And what we find is that in the molecular cloud and pre-stellar core kernel environments, only interstellar planetesimals smaller than a millimeter could get trapped by the gas. While in the denser protoplanetary disks, um, uh, what we find is that objects larger than a meter could get trapped. If planetesimals trap in these protoplanetary disks could grow um, uh, planetesimals trapped in this protoplanetary disk could go quickly 
uh, via the direct accretion of these particles less than a centimeter. And this could allow the masses of the planetesimals to grow by a factor of a million before mutual collisions and erosion become important. So the trap of interstellar planetesimals by gas drag in this denser environment could potentially provide seeds for planet formation. The question is, how many seeds can be trapped and how many do we need to assist the planet formation process? This trapping mechanism could not provide this first generation of seeds because for these seeds to form, you need planet formation to have succeeded in the first place. But because there is the expectation that more and more planetesimals are ejected from planetary systems into the interstellar medium as time goes by, as the number density of these ejected of, uh, bodies increase in the galaxy, it might alleviate the meter size buried in subsequent generations of planet forming disks. So the observations in the next decade are going to revolutionize our understanding of the formation, evolution, and diversity of planetary systems because of the planet surveys and the disk studies, but also because of the numerous solar system objects and interstellar planetesimals that the Rubin Observatory will surely discover. So it started in 2022, the Rubin Observatory will systematically survey the sky more deeply than has ever been attempted and will do it repeatedly. And it is expected that it will detect many interstellar interlopers along with a huge number of asteroids, comets, and KBOs. And as I told you, it is estimated that there are about 10,000 interstellar planetesimals um, uh, like Oumuamua uh, or larger, and this is at any given time. However, only two have been discovered so far. And as you saw, they couldn't be more different. With the Vera Rubin Observatory, we may detect one object per month, allowing uh, for follow-up observations with other observatories. So the population studies of interstellar planetesimals with Rubin and other observatories will be able to address how many interlopers are iceless and weirdly shaped like Oumuamua versus those that are similar to a comet like Borisov. What is the size distribution that is very important to understand the origin? What is their velocity distribution? What are they made of? And if some of them are really porous enough to be pushed around by radiation pressure. And let me finish with um, this fragment from the Bayou Tapestry from uh, 1066. Uh, this is almost, almost a thousand years old. And I like it because it shows bewildered British uh, observing Comet Halley. This is Comet Halley. And it summarizes well how much we have yet to learn about interstellar interlopers. But rather than evoking fear like comets evoke at the time, in this case probably didn't help that it was the same year that the French invaded Britain. So it was, <laughs> they thought it was an omen. These interstellar objects in our case evoke tremendous excitement and anticipation because they have truly opened a new era in astronomy in which we can dream of closely examining and maybe even holding in our hands a fragment from another world beyond the solar system. Oops, and if you have any questions. <laughs> Thank you very much, <clears throat> Amaya, for this wonderful talk. And uh, now the talk is open for uh, questions. Please, for the participants, uh, raise your hand and I will allow you to ask the question. Maybe I can start with one. Um, we know from other studies that the, there is a dust stream in the region of uh, Jupiter and, and Saturn from the detector, the, the dust detector in the Ulysses mission and Galileo mission. So we detected other small objects uh, from not from the solar system. So can we say that Wamua and Borisov are not the first one, but the, the larger one? Yeah, in fact, yes. And they are also micrometeorites that right. have been detected to have a solar and uh, an extrasolar system origin. So you are absolutely right. So this is just a, a population, it's part of the population. But uh, unfortunately, we still don't have enough objects in order to learn what is the, the size distribution. And in the case of Oumuamua and Borisov, we don't even know if they belong to the same distribution. Another interesting aspect that I look at was um, at the micro lensing events 
uh, there are also planets that are free floating, right? Then you can get some information on the number density, right, from microlensing. Unfortunately, um, even in the near future or even on the, you know, mid-sized future, um, we won't be able to detect uh, things that are um, less massive than Mars. So, um, so trying to draw a size distribution from Mars-sized objects to something of the size of Muamua is very problematic, right? But that's another aspect of the distribution, right? We have these free floating planets that are probably coming from, from planetary systems, right? And that they were ejected. So, so the question is, you know, is all this part of the same population? I think the, the, the main conclusion is that we are not in a clean, isolated, isolated system. So no, there are right. other systems. All yeah, the exactly, exactly. Yes, which is very exciting, right? That we are just, you know, we I are imagine, changing things with our neighbors. <laughs> I imagine the, the whole the whole solar system like a large comet that are uh, throwing away small particles. Right, and also is the fact that, you know, the ore clouds of the different stars are touching really, right? So there's also a change at that level. Right. Okay, more questions for Amaya? Isabel? Mm, yeah, it's a question of, um, typical of a non-expert uh, as I am. So. Um, and, and I don't know whether, whereas you yes. said that before, I'm sorry if you already so, uh, said so, um, you, you, to, you told us that the name uh, Muamua is coming from, the, the, so the object coming from the outside or whatever, but uh, did you say why is the, the name Borisov? Oh, Borisov, yes. Borisov was actually the person that discovered uh, the second interstellar object. And Borisov, it's a very interesting story because Borisov is an optical engineer um, from uh, Ukraine and um, he discovered uh, so remember that I was saying that we were surprised that Muamua was discovered with such a small telescope, pan stars, right? Well, Borisov was discovered with a 0.5 meter telescope that Borisov himself built. So it, he was an amateur astronomer, not, a, not any amateur astronomer because he's an optical engineer, but it was discovered with a 0.5 meter telescope. So uh, one of the things that I, I cannot understand yet is why we haven't been able to discover more objects like this, because it's not that we have not been searching. Um, we've been searching for a while, but these objects have not been identified. So it's probably a question of perception. Uh, and that these objects have always been out there. Maybe some of them have been a spot previously, but it hasn't really been until there was such a clear example of one of them that, you know, we believe that those detections are real. Because I cannot understand why we haven't been able to see an object like this one. Even pan stars, pan stars have been operating for a while, right? So it's something that I have yet to understand. But, uh, so something we've been doing wrong, right? I think something we've been ruined. Yeah, maybe these objects were identified by amateur astronomers and we were not taking them seriously because it's not that we haven't been looking outside of the clip, mm -hmm. right? So, uh, and it's not that we haven't had this technology before. Uh, so how comes that after we discover Boris uh, Oumuamua two years later, we have, you know, Boris uh, um, discovered with such a small telescope, so, right? So have we asked Boris himself what, what he did? Uh, I, I I think there are interviews, yeah, but I, I don't know exactly the story. Okay. I don't know if he was um, targeting this type of objects in particular. Um, uh, but I guess, you know, since Muamua was already discovered, he was probably, his algorithms were probably more, you know, they, they were, sent, you know, they, he already knew that this was a possibility, right? Mm -hmm. But it's, it's really surprising that um, not more have been discovered. But this is why I'm so hopeful that we are going to get many more in the future. OK, so thank you very much. Very, very interesting talk, Amaya. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Isabel. Now we have a question by Stella. Yeah. Also, uh, hello. Thank you, Amaya, for the talk. It, it's been very nice. So my question is regarding the shape of Homuamua. It is, uh, you might explain this in, during the talk, but it is weird for me to understand how it keeps any of the proposed shapes. How, how it keeps the shape and it doesn't, you mean? Yeah, it, 
so be, because of the long journey in the interstellar space? For instance, or yeah, or, I, I mean, how did how can it form this um, weird shape, either like a cigar or like a? Oh yes, like... yes, yes, because this this shape, this six to one uh, elongated shape, is very unusual, right? I mean, they are not really yes. obvious in the solar system that are like that. Well, in the case of, uh, of the scenario that I propose, that is a fractal aggregate, you can get shapes that are um, oddly shaped, right? In the case of the fractal aggregate, that you know it's formed either in a protoplanetary disk because it's one of these intermediate products, or that is formed as others uh, propose, uh, uh, like a desiccated fragment of a solar system, extrasolar comet that you know is fragmented, and this is one of these fragments. So in this case. You could get this type of shapes. Um, then you have the other uh, argument um, that this is like a um, fragment from an object that got too close to the star. And from the tidal disruption, uh, they can explain this type of elongated shape as well. And there are still other arguments um, based on the, on, on the erosion from interstellar dust acting on the objects for millions and millions of years. So there is an article that claim that they can also explain these um, odd uh, shapes um, just based on the sputtering of the, of the grains, of the interstellar medium grains. But uh, I totally agree with you that it's very hard to explain. And so, and, you know, um, so this object, the nature of this object is really unknown. And for, Umoa, for Borisov, we didn't have any evidence that this was the case. It's also true that it is more difficult to, because it had a coma, it's more difficult to, to study the shape. But from what it was a study, that it, it didn't have any evidence of, of being diselongated. So um, I have no answer to your question. We just, we just don't really know because it's the nature of the mystery, right? We just don't, need, we don't know what, what is the nature of this object. And it is similar for the disk shape, like the the other one that explain the non gravitational forces. Right. Yeah. yeah for, similar case. In fact, I think the sputtering, uh, the the sputtering scenario where the erosion was is 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 helping form the the shape. I think it's more in agreement with the disk uh, shape, whereas the a scenario in which. This is like a fragment from a tidal disruption of an orb of a body that got too close to the star uh, in its host system. I think it's more in agreement with this elongated. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Although, um, for example, Arrokov's uh, uh, levels uh, are similar to the other, right? That you have like this. Um, um, so Arrokot is formed by two objects, right? That, and they are very thin and uh, you mean the, 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 you mean, what, what, can you repeat that? Arrokot, the object that was visited by New Horizon. Oh, yes. It would be similar to the other one, right? Oh, to this one, to, the, to this one. Yeah, one of the levels. One of the, ah, uh, yes, 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 yes. Yes, that's right, that's right, you're right. Oh. Well, anyway, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank you, Stella. Before the question of Adriano, please, if you have any question and you have problem with micro, you can write it on the chat and I, I can read it. So do it if you want. And okay, go on, Adriano. Hello, good morning. Thank you very much, Amaya, for your beautiful talk and for your work. Um, I see that the, the eccentricity of Oumuamua is 1.2, which is not so far from a bound uh, orbit after all. So I wonder if it has been completely ruled out that the object is, a, a let's say, an extreme uh, Oort cloud uh, body uh, somehow um, perturbed by the close encounter with the with some planet, which may, who knows, also explain the the the, the tidal distortion of the, yeah. of the object. Thank it you. has, I think, it has been ruled out, and the dynamics haven't been able to um, account for that eccentricity. It's one point two, is true, but it's still too high. Uh, so um, the the incoming velocity that it has 
none of the solar system bodies could have uh, produced that kick. So I think it's been ruled out. What um, it's interesting is the scenario that was proposed by Jane Lu and her group that it was that Muamua is really, it has a solar system origin. And what happened is that um, it formed in the coma of an Oort cloud comet and it is ultra porous and you know you have, um, and, and because of this shape, uh, you have radiation pressure. And what I don't know is how they can throw this into the inner solar system. I don't understand the dynamics of that part, but I think um, that overall it's been ruled out and uh, that it has a solar system origin. And for Borisov, the eccentricity is around three. So- um, Yeah, for Borisov it's, uh, it's something. Yeah, 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 yeah. But for Oumuamua, um, the problem with Oumuamua that I mentioned very briefly is that we only saw it uh, on its way outside the solar system. So we didn't see it coming. And this also limits our ability, right, to, to track the orbit. But I think a, a solar system object um, uh, with, you know, a standard structure has been ruled out. Okay, thank you. And another thing that I didn't mention earlier is that this idea that it could be a fragment, a desiccated fragment from an extrasolar comet that uh, just fragmented when it was close to perihelion, that has a problem. And is that, I told you that we cannot account for how much mass is implied to be out there if Muamua is isotropically distributed and is around 100 meters inside. If we try to account for how much mass is out there, if Muamua were to be coming from an normal comet about a kilometer inside and Muamua were only a fragment, then the, that problem is even worse, is significantly worse. So, so it's very exciting because we don't really know. <laughs> Okay, uh, thank you, Adriano. There is a question in the chat by Pablo Santos. He said, what about the theory that Wamua is made of molecular uh, hydrogen? What do you think about that? Yeah, so uh, Avi Loef and his group have, have, uh, they have looked into the survival and they have completely ruled out that origin because molecular hydrogen is extremely volatile. So they think that it just wouldn't be able to survive uh, for, for long after it leaves the, the molecular cloud. So I look at that paper and I, I thought it was a convincing argument that is difficult to justify, right? But you know, I'm, I also have to admit that the, the proposal that I put forward is also you know, difficult to, to, you know, you have to, um, to look into how an ultra porous aggregate could survive as well, right? And, and how it could be formed and survive ejection and survive. So, um, but this one about the molecular, the, you know, this giant iceberg, I think just based on simple arguments that have to do with, you know, how volatile molecular hydrogen is, I think that's enough to rule out that hypothesis. Okay. I have a question. Uh about this uh, kind of fractal objects, how, how large can be uh, one of these kind of objects? In the, in the 100 meters, this is the... the, the yeah, the, if you look uh, at the, yeah, if you look at the plot, I mean, this is, this is just a schematic representation of the plot in, this, um, in these papers here in Okusumi 2009 and 2012. But they get to very low densities for objects up to 10 kilometers in size. But this is, so this is the result of dynamic of, of you know, uh, planetesimal formation models. Um, obviously we don't have evidence, observational evidence that these objects are out there, right? But, but in their simulations, these objects, these ultra low density objects can be quite large, so the comets. Actually they have a problem and is that they have the problem that what they create is way too is, is, is way too porous. And what they want to create is things like comets, because, <laughs> because we see comets, right? So you want something of a porosity of around 0.5. Um, so they have that problem is that what they produce is just too porous. So, uh, so they try to find ways of, you know, how you can um, get them more compact, right? With, you know, maybe with gas, the effect of gas and, um, but yeah, it was, 
when, when I was uh, proposing this fractal aggregate hypothesis, I actually work on this and I look at the numbers and I go to this very low number density. And I was like, oh, there is no way. I mean, this proves that because I mean, this density is ridiculous, right? 100 times less than air. So I was like, well, this proves that this is, you know, that this is not a possible scenario. But then I found these other papers and I was like, oh, <laughs> this is very interesting, right? But um, but yeah, it will be it will be fantastic if you know we start to find more objects. If well, actually, if we find objects that we can confirm are that ultra porous, it will be amazing because um, it will be the first time that we can actually see one of these intermediate products of the planet formation uh, uh, of the planet formation process. And we know very little about this process, right? We just know what happens at the end and what's at the very beginning, right? At, in the protoplanetary disks, but. So, an, object, an object that size with that density is more like a cloud. Yeah, yeah, that's why, you know, yeah, that, like a, a journalist call it a dust bunny. I thought it was, you know, interesting or a giant, you know, um, uh, ice, uh, a snowflake, right? Yeah, it will be like a ball of something, you're right. What about really it? weird, yeah, really weird. Mm. Nice, nice to think about that, okay. Yeah. Any other question for Amaya? I mean, the other option is that um, the acceleration is explained by gases that, uh, but uh, by, you know, uh, gas, the, the ejection of gases that were not detected because it's with a composition that we just don't expect, that is very different from what you would expect in the solar system. But we just don't have, the problem is the dust, because any gas, whatever the composition, will drag uh, dust along. And there was no dust outflow either. So, so we really, so really our hope is, is to look at, you know, the next ones and see how they look like. And if, the, if Oumuamua was just a one-off or if there is evidence that other also show this acceleration and no coma and no dust outflow. It's, it's a bubble of helium, for example, that, <laughs> that is good. So, now you have your own hypothesis. <laughs> Welcome to the club. <laughs> <coughs> Okay, any other question for Amaya? Uh, Mike, Mike Kefrul, is it possible that we did observe interstellar interlopers in the past, but the orbit determination for that objects or comets were with the eccentricity around one were not good enough to identify yeah. them as an, as an interlopers? Yeah, and I hope uh, I don't know if people are doing this. I hope they are. I hope they're looking at the archives and looking at. Well, I know they are actually. Um, they are. There has been a few papers on on you know looking at uh, archive archival data and trying to identify which one we may have missed. Uh, so yes, it's totally possible, and and I wouldn't be surprised if there are results coming out in the next few years about this because. As I said, Borisov with, was detected with a 0.5 meter telescope. I mean. <laughs> okay, I think we can close the talk here. Any other questions? Thank you very much, Maya. Thank you very much. Wonderful talk. The next one in Granada. <laughs> next one in Granada, you'll be sure. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, bye bye.